You are now listening to Nailed It, the orthopedic surgery podcast. Now, dear Earhart, welcome, welcome back to the Nailed It Ortho podcast. One of our very first guests a couple of years ago. You have uh, so graciously returned, so welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be back. Yeah, and and just for everybody listening, if if this is uh, one of your first times listening to the podcast, Dr. Earhart was our second um, second episode ever ever released on uh, trauma kind of basic principles, and uh, it's one of the top five listened top listened episodes uh, of all time that we have. So uh, it was a really good episode. Go and check that out. Uh, but we've we got you back, luckily, and now we're going to talk a little bit about the compartment syndrome of the leg. So, um, what I guess is overall, just we could just we could just pretend as if nobody know, has any idea what compartment syndrome is. But what is compartment syndrome in general, and then we can get into like what are some of the causes of compartment syndrome and go from there. Sure. Well, uh, you know, compartment syndrome is um, uh, kind of the effects of usually an acute injury to the lower limb, uh, resulting in uh, swelling that causes an increase in the subfascial pressure of the muscle compartments. And when those pressures build up to the point that they can cause, um, you know, microvenous collapse, uh, affecting outflow and backing up blood flow, or even uh, collapse of the capillary networks, uh, you can end up with irreversible damage to the, the muscles and nerves, and it can be a, a limb threatening problem. So it's one of the true orthopedic emergencies that we take care of. Yeah, this is like, you know, you, you hear about this in the middle of the night, like you wake up in the middle of the night and you go and you, and you take care of this. It's one of those ER buzzwords. <laughs> and in uh, in your experience, what are being kind of the patients that have had this? What kind of injuries have they had? Like, what are some of the causes of of a, of a compartment syndrome? So I guess specifically lower extremity, but in general, sure. Um, you know, the the three classes of patients that I've been called for with it um, tends to be blunt force trauma are the most common, um, in particular to the lower half of the lower extremity, um, and that's probably the vast majority of the ones that I see. Um, being at a burn center, we sometimes see it in burn patients where, um, the, the burns to the, the soft tissues, um, uh, create an inelasticity that can, um, uh, lead to, uh, symptoms of compartment syndrome and the sequelae of it. Uh, you can see it with some, uh, penetrating trauma, uh, ballistic injuries, uh, to the limbs. And then the, uh, the last ones that I see most commonly would be, uh, patients who um, are found down after several hours, whether it's from yep. a fall with inability to get up, uh, drug or alcohol abuse, um, and things like that, where they're laying in the same position for so long that um, they get local swelling and the results. Um, less commonly, uh, we see it in uh, patients with um, acute uh, loss of uh, blood flow to the limbs. And in the process of reperfusing, they get a, a swelling, which can lead to what's known as a reperfusion injury. And uh, swelling, which can lead to uh, compartment syndrome as well. So, those would be the main ones. But I'd say in my in my practice, it's uh, it's blunt force trauma almost every yeah. day. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned it a little bit earlier when you first were kind of giving the the description of of compartment syndrome. But just just really quickly, one more time, can you kind of just touch on the the pathophysiology behind you know compartment syndrome and what actually happens? And again, you touched on it earlier, but just to reiterate the the you know to to the people listening. Sure. Um, so anything that causes um, acute swelling, whether it's just, uh, you know, tissue expansion as a result of trauma, uh, it can be bleeding, um, it can be um, local edema, but anything that, that causes an acute swelling within the muscle compartments um, leads to uh, pressure up against the inelastic uh, uh, fascial coverings of those compartments. And because they aren't able to give way, as the swelling continues, the pressure goes up. And once the pressure gets within what we call the perfusion pressure around 30 millimeters of mercury of diastolic blood pressure, what you start to see is one of two things, either collapse of the, the, uh, the, the outflow venous system within the muscles uh, leading to uh, backup and resulting perfusion problems or an actual collapse of the microvasculature, the capillary network itself, um, and the inability of, of blood to permeate that microvascular structure uh, resulting in hypoxia to the tissues, primarily the muscles and nerves. Um, if that's allowed to go unimpeded, you end up with um, uh, cellular death. And in the case of muscles, which um, are particularly full of uh, really cytotoxic uh, substances, um, potassium, myoglobin, et cetera, um, if those uh, processes are allowed to continue, 
and cell death uh, occurs, you can end up with significant systemic illness, um, you know, with uh, uh, hyperkalemia resulting in, in arrhythmias, which can be life-threatening. Um, myoglobinuria, or sorry, my, myoglobinemia, I think that'd be the right word, but uh, right. That, uh, th those, those, um, those molecules of uh, muscle proteins can end up in the kidneys and cause uh, damage to the microtubules, which can lead to acute kidney failure. So it can really be um, not just a limb-threatening problem, which it is in the, in the short term, but a life-threatening problem in the intermediate term. Yeah. And, and so say, you know, you have a resident and, you know, say the resident's on call and somebody call them about compartment syndrome, rule out, you know, in the ED and they go down there and they see the patient and they come back to you and um, they're trying to tell you kind of how they examine the patient. Like what, what are some of the things that you want them to tell you? Like, what are some of the things that is, um, that are important to look out for on a physical exam when they're examining these patients? Sure. I think there's, uh, there's really two classes of patient in this setting. There's the awake and um, uh, participating patient, and then there's the obtunded patient. And yeah. those are kind of vastly different evaluations. So for the awake uh, patient who is able to participate in exam, it really starts with an observation of the patient. Um, so we've all seen patients with acute injuries. We've all seen post-operative patients. And we have a fairly good understanding of what it means to have acute pain, whether it's post-surgical or post-injury. Um, patients with compartment syndrome are a different breed. They are truly at the edge of their bed, um, you know, white knuckling the sides of their bed in, in the most pain they've ever had in their entire life. So um, of the, the infamous six Ps, it's really an assessment of just how acutely painful and uncomfortable the patient is above and beyond everything else. Um, so these patients, you know, they're, they're wide eyed, uh, they're gripping the bed, um, nothing, they won't, they don't want to be touched. They don't want to be moved and uh, no pain medicine is really touching their, their pain. It's a, it's a very, unique thing. And once you see it, you can't really unsee it. Um, for the uh, obtunded patients, a little bit different. And so, um, you know, similar, similarly to the awake patient where you see them in a lot of pain, you examine the limb. These limbs are, you know, usually pretty swollen, but they really have a unique feel to them. They're, they're quite firm. Um, you know, sometimes it's just a, a lack of uh, give when you're palpating the compartments, but in, in really bad situations, I mean, they can be a, as firm as, you know, a, a hunk of wood. It really is quite remarkable in, in some circumstances, um, both near the zone of injury, but kind of within the, the realm of the compartment, even proximally or distally to, to the known injury. Um, when you're examining these patients, so they're going to feel firm. Um, when you go to try to manipulate the leg or the arm or whatever it is, um, you know, they're not going to want you to move it at all. So you go down downstream, you know, in the case of the lower extremity, usually to the foot for a lower leg uh, concern. And when you try to move these patients distally, passively, and you uh, induce motions that put the affected compartment on stretch, they jump off the bed. Um, they, yeah. they really just do not tolerate it. Um, so so it's, these, uh, it's this ex uh, extreme pain with what we call passive stretch to the limb, uh, distal to the injury or distal to the zone of concern. And then as you say here in the slide, um, you know, if you have a patient who's already numb or unable to move, uh, that's, it's too late. Everything's dead. Um, so although that's a really um, convenient, uh, you know, P to add to the six P's, it's sort of, that's the end stage. That's where you're already too late. Yeah. And then you mentioned, you know, when the, in the awake patient, you're able to, you know, observe them and see how they're doing. And, and, you know, when you stretch their compartments, they jump off the bed, but then you did mention in the intubator, the obtunded patient that it's a little bit harder. And so, you know, we always read about, you know, checking the compartments and using like a needle to check them. Mm -hmm. What, I guess, what is your indication to do that? And then if you, if you do do that, what exactly are you looking for? How do you do it? Sure. Um, so I think, you know, when you're talking about an obtunded patient, um, you want to just have a brief understanding of the, the mechanism of the problem that brought them there in the first place. So if this is a patient you know, with an obvious extremity injury, like a fracture or penetrating trauma or something like that, or if they have, um, you know, a known arterial injury, et cetera, you know, you're going to be a little more specific in your exam. If it's a patient who was found down, you really do want to look up and down the extremity, um, other extremities, the side of the body. Um, don't just focus on the one area you've been called about. But with that aside, um, you know, an, an intubated, obtunded patient is one that really can't respond to your exam. And so then, um, you're sort of in, in a situation where you need some objective data to help you make decisions. So the leg will still feel firm. Um, hopefully it's not pulseless again, then it's too late. Um, but um, a compartment pressure check uh, using um, a compartment needle monitor, um, uh, like the one shown in the picture, is really the, the, the only way to get any objective data. And so 
Um, if you're going to do this, there's a whole process for it. I don't know if you want me to go into all that, but yeah, essentially sure, you need to. to, sure. You really need to just, the idea is you want to use that monitor for each of the uh, um, uh, affected compartments. So for the lower limb, you can't just check once one spot. You really need to check all four compartments independently and know how to get that needle into each of the compartments. There's a little bit of controversy in terms of how close to the injury do you need to be? Uh, you know, do you want to be within the zone of injury? Is that more diagnostic than say further downstream within the compartment where, you know, theoretically the pressure should still be elevated? Um, you need to have good technique. So it's not just about sterility. It's also about the way you use uh, the monitor. So I'm familiar most with the monitor that looks just like the one in the picture. And the idea is that it has to first be primed appropriately, has to be turned on, obviously make sure the battery is working. But when you're inserting the needle, you have to hold it at a steady flat angle so that you're not inducing extra pressure within the needle just by the way you're holding it. Mm -hmm. um, you wanna make sure the needle goes into each of the four compartments. Um, if you're doing the thigh, you gotta make sure that you check each of the three compartments. So again, you have to kind of understand your anatomy. And so once the needle is in the appropriate compartment, ideally kind of within the center of the muscle groups within that compartment, you're going to inject a little bit of the saline and then give it time to level out and get a reading. You're not going to go with the first number that pops up. It's going to spike and then it's going to start to flatten out at a general pressure for, um, for that compartment. And so what you want to do is you want to look at that number and then compare it to the diastolic blood pressure of the patient. So if it's within 30 millimeters of mercury of the diastolic, um, or if it's uh, higher than, than, or if it's less than 30 millimeters of mercury um, relative to the diastolic, you worry that there's not enough pressure within the system for blood to continue to flow through the compartment, through the muscles. So any, um, you know, again, when we get into what's a positive test, whether it's a single reading or a trend or whatever, it, again, it gets a little bit uh, subjective and subject to discussion, but um, the main take home points, make sure that you check each of the compartments, make sure that you know how to get the needle into each, use good technique, and ideally get multiple data points. You know, if you have a patient who's safe, but close and you have a high suspicion, you're either taking them to the OR or you're checking them with serial exams or, you know, in the best case scenario with a continuous monitoring system, which some hospitals have access to. Yeah. I've, you know, some of our attendings and I, and I've heard that, you know, if the suspicion is high enough for, mm -hmm. you know, a compartment syndrome that you should probably do a fasciotomy. Um, but this mm -hmm. is another tool um, mm -hmm. to have to use, you know, if you just want some more objective data, like you were saying. Absolutely. And so, you know, when I was reading an article and they and they talk about lab tests, I do you do you ever get routine lab tests or, you know, to see the level of muscle necrosis or is that just more of just a thing to know that you could get? Oh boy, yeah. I mean, so there there is ongoing research out there looking for certain biomarkers and um, other kind of uh, objective blood measures of really it's the sequelae of um, compartment pressures, whether it's right. pH, whether it's um, the, the CK levels and, and other things. And that's, that's not, that's not the, really the standard. If you're waiting for blood work on a patient that you suspect is having compartment syndrome, you're really not doing the patient a, a service. I yeah. think the only role for the serum uh, creatinine phosphokinase level is when you have a patient who, unfortunately you got to too late. Um, they already have evidence of myonecrosis and you're really waiting to see, um, when these levels start to peak and then go back down again, because you're trying to protect the kidneys throughout that process. You're trying to keep them excessively hydrated. You're trying to prevent irreversible damage to the kidneys at that point. So I don't see that as a, a good diagnostic tool. I see that as a monitoring system to get through the, uh, the unfortunate outcome of a missed compartment syndrome. Yeah. And, and so say, for example, you know, we have our patient, let's just say 37 year old males in a motorcycle collision, blunt trauma, tibial plateau fracture, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you're checking them, pain with passive strain, stretch, and you are concerned for compartment syndrome. What is our, what is our treatment? Like, how do we go about, you know, you know, say, I know there are a bunch of different scenarios. Like, for example, if a cast was on a little bit too tight and you may take the cast mm -hmm. down first, but what is it kind of our, our general generic treatment for, <laughs> for compartment syndrome? Okay. Well, I mean, certainly, you know, if, if you have a patient who's coming in acutely and they have a tight splint or a cast, yes, you can remove that, remove tight dressings. Right. You, you give them like five minutes, 10 minutes tops to see if they, you know, truly respond to that. Because if, if they don't, it'll be pretty clear and you're not going to want to waste a lot of time um, with those types of things. Sure. You know, elevate the leg and all those kind of things. But at the end of the day, if you truly suspect it, you need to start getting them ready for the OR. And the really the only treatment for this uh, is, a, is a fasciotomy, is a release of the 
uh, fascial enclosure of each of the affected compartments, um, getting the skin and, and the fascia open and allowing for a release of the pressure um, to restore perfusion to the limb. That's it. Yeah. And, and one of the things that, that, that I didn't even know when I was reading this, that they were uh, at least saying in the article was that, you know, when you think about it, you're like, OK, well, we need to prop the leg up. So hopefully this can decrease the swelling to the leg. But they were saying you actually shouldn't elevate the the leg uh, uh, above their heart in order to maximize perfusion while minimizing swelling. Now, I hadn't heard of this before, but I mean, it makes sense when you when you say it out loud. Is it something sure. that you know, in your experience, you know, that, that you tell you know your residents or anybody to do or you know, if you're, if you're monitoring it, I think it's, um, it's an interesting thing to talk about here when no one's limb is at risk, but if there's a limit risk, I don't care what position it's in. It, it's position yeah. better be horizontal on an operating table. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Perfect. And, and if we could, um, cause we know, you know, we know we're going to do a fasciotomy we're going to release the fascia and, and release the compartment. Uh, if we could kind of just go through just quickly, like some of the different compartments, like the gluteal compartment, the thigh kind of, how, how we just do those um, fasciotomies. Sure. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's not a difficult surgery. It's just a basic understanding of the local anatomy. And as you can see here in the picture, this is, this is not MIS surgery. This is not sports medicine. This is big open incisions. This is uh, get everything exposed, get the uh, fascial enclosures opened, you know, explore the muscle, look for any signs of uh, dead or devitalized tissue that may need to be removed right away. If you didn't get to it acutely enough. Um, and, uh, just, just doing wide open releases. Um, and then at the end of the day, most of the time, these, these things, the muscles are going to pop out at you. These wounds are going to be really big and open. And then it's just, uh, you know, wound management. And unfortunately, a lot of these patients go on to need uh, skin grafting and other types of uh, assistance for coverage or closure. Yeah. And one thing for the thigh, uh, when you have the compartment syndrome of the thigh, in my very, very, very limited experience, and from what some of our attendees have told me, mm -hmm. that typically a, just a long lateral incision is okay, and it typically decompresses in compartments. So have you ever had to do a medial incision as well in the thigh? Or Yeah, I have not, thankfully. Um, and it's not that it's necessarily super difficult to do, but it's certainly an unsavory location to have a large open incision, especially one that's going to require skin grafting, particularly in a larger patient. Um, I can count the number of thigh compartments I've had you know, on two hands, at least maybe just one hand. So it's not a common thing. I have seen it uh, a few times. One of my very first cases ever in practice day one of my, my first job out of fellowship uh, was a 17 year old with compartment syndrome of the thigh and leg uh, after a floating knee injury the night before. So I had yes. a, I had a, a quick exposure to it, but I haven't seen yes. too many since. And yeah, I agree. In my experience, a large lateral incision, um, opening up the IT band, uh, making sure that if you need to, you uh, op you do uh, scoring of the uh, the fascia of the vastus lateralis as well, and then just an opening of the intermuscular septum uh, to release pressure in the posterior compartment tends to be enough. But you, you got to palpate medially, and and frankly, if you're concerned that medially it's still um, tense, uh, you have you have to you have to do it. Um, and I'd say that's probably more common, you know, in ballistic trauma, other things where maybe there's a uh, some sort of a bleeding vessel sort of situation. Um, yeah. but in, in the blunt trauma that I've seen with the thigh compartment syndrome release of the anterior and posterior compartments has been enough, you know, thankfully for the ones I've treated. Okay. And, and one of the last things is the, the lower leg, which I think is one of the more, um, you know, the more frequented, you know, when you have compartment syndrome is more of the lower leg. Mm -hmm. uh, can you kind of talk about some of the different techniques for doing a fasciotomy of the lower leg and then when to do one versus the other, or when you do one versus the other? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, we're talking about traumatic compartment syndrome. So obviously there's a phenomenon of exertional compartment syndrome, which may lend itself right. to smaller incisions. So we're talking about, you know, the real deal as a result of either reperfusion injury, um, uh, blunt or penetrating trauma, um, and not something that you're going to do through a small incision, no matter what you choose. Um, in my experience, um, you know, it, it's really nice to, to do the ones, the one incision, um, uh, fasciotomy. It uh, obviously, you know, preserves the other side of the medial side of the leg. Um, what I, what, how I've kind of constructed my algorithm is that when I am treating the lower limb um, in the setting of a plateau fracture, I try to think of what my definitive treatments are going to be. So, um, you know, most often if you have a, a plateau fracture that has resulted in a compartment syndrome, it's a bicondylar or plateau and probably going to need um, uh, a, an approach and fixation of each column medially and laterally. So I actually really like the single incision 
uh, fasciotomy because it's so well centered in the leg. Um, it's generally out of the way of the kind of minimally invasive anterolateral approach, which is the workhorse for reconstructing the lateral joint. Um, it leaves enough of a skin bridge to facilitate that, that standard approach, which is um, appropriate for most of those uh, fracture patterns, but you still have to keep in mind what you're going to do definitively. And most importantly, it leaves the medial side completely uh, free of any incisions, um, which is good for a number of reasons, obviously for future approaches, but also because in these patients with acute swelling, there can be a tendency for skin blistering and other um, post-swelling problems with the soft tissues. And if you can avoid a large incision immediately, I think that's great. Um, the one time that I have been um, um, kind of disappointed in a single incision uh, approach is in the setting of a tibia plafond, you know, pilon fracture. Um, if you have a long lateral incision centered on the fibula extending down towards the ankle to release compartments, it can make it very difficult, particularly in a skinny patient, uh, to adequately expose the tibia plafond um, for definitive management. So in the setting of, of most tibia pilon fractures, you know, in the acute setting, you're not going to take a ton of time to analyze a CT of the ankle. You may not even have a CT of the ankle yet. Um, and you may not know exactly what your definitive management is going to be in terms of your incisions. But for the most part, um, if you use the two incision approach to fasciotomy releases, which consists uh, of an anterolateral and a posterior medial approach, those incisions are readily extensile into the ankle for really quite excellent exposure of the tibia plafond to manage most um, articular injuries to the ankle. So I find that those that the two incision technique tends to be more compatible with um, significant trauma to the ankle, whereas the one incision technique is really advantageous um, in the setting of a plateau fracture. Right. And for those that are listening, are, are, we're talking about the, the lower leg and, re, and releasing the four compartments, the anterior, the Correct. lateral, and then the two posterior. The Thank you. Yeah, I should have said that. Either way, all four compartments need to be released. So um, it doesn't matter which approach you take from the skin, you better release all four compartments. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we have a, a great video that you showed or that you have uh, graciously given to us. We're showing your technique for the one incision, um, for the one incision fasciotomy, uh, which is a very, very great video for those listening to this on the, on the audio podcast, check it out on YouTube. Our video will be uh, playing very shortly. And uh, again, I think it was a, a really great video and a really good breakdown of the anatomy as well as the technique. And before we wrap up here, any any other, you know, anything else you want the the people to know about, you know, about um, lower leg, you know, compartment syndrome? Um, no, I, I would say that um, it, it truly is a, a clinical diagnosis. So I guess what I would do is encourage uh, any residents who are out there when they're on, whether they're on their trauma rotations or not, if, if you hear of a patient that has a suspected compartment syndrome and you have the ability to join your colleagues to examine the patient or to be in the operating room, take that opportunity. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a diagnosis that's clinical, but it's a diagnosis of experience. And as much as we say that, um, you know, if you suspect it, you should do it, doing a four compartment fasciotomy of the lower leg or a two or three compartment fasciotomy of the thigh is a morbid procedure for the patient. It's a big deal. And it's not benign, it's not without its own host of potential complications or issues. So although it's always better to do one and be wrong than to not do one and be wrong, um, it, it, still, it still has a, a big impact on the patient. And so make sure that you take every opportunity you have to see a patient with it or with a suspected compartment syndrome and really take a mental note of how those patients are behaving, what their limb looks like and how it examines and commit those to memory. And the more you see it, the less often you're ever going to miss it. Yeah, I think very well said. And actually, just just one one more quick question is um, in, in your in your experience, how have the patients done long term? Like, you know, like back to you know after you do the fasciotomy and after you get the skin closed, whether it needs a some type of a skin graft or not. Um, like in the long term, are they end up doing pretty okay, walking around fine, or you know, do they have any issues? And you know, in your experience, what have you seen? Yeah, fortunately, um, the the sequelae of the compartment syndrome itself, if you get to it in adequate time is, is not too terrible. Um, you know, a few patients have had to have multiple skin grafts, um, a, you know, a couple people with, you know, local infections. I, I haven't seen a deep infection, knock on wood from a, a compartment syndrome or from a fasciotomy yet. Um, but most of the outcome tends to be from, you know, the totality of the injury. So these tend to occur, like I said, in 
blunt trauma and crush injuries. So there can be a whole host of problems going on with the limb and compartment syndrome is just one of those parts. Um, release of the uh, compartments can theoretically lead to a decrease in muscle power or stamina. You know, there can be some stamina issues for these patients, especially ones that are used to a higher level of function. Um, but for the most part, if you get to it in time, um, it really narrows the, uh, the, the functional sequelae to, um, to the rest of the injury. So, um, you know, if, again, the key, the key is to make an, uh, an accurate and rapid diagnosis and, and get the patient treated. Yeah, well, Dr. Earhart, again, this has uh, been a great episode. I learned a lot again. Um, you know, thank you for taking your time to come out and come on the episode. And and if you want to, for those listening, how can they, you know, they follow you? And I, I follow your your social media pages. Y'all have good cases on there. Um, but for those who want to follow you, how can they, you know, how can they follow you and keep in contact and sure. check out some of the cases that you have? No, I appreciate it. Um, and by the way, congrats on all your success. You know, your, your sites are really fantastic. I'm a fan of yours. Um, oh, thanks. Yeah. So yeah, I'm on Instagram um, at Dr. Earhart trauma with underscores. Um, and uh, yeah, join the discussion. You know, I'm, I've learned as much as I've taught. I, I hope, I hope I've taught people some stuff, but I, I learn a ton through it. I love interacting with everyone and um, you know, I'm, I'm just putting out there what I do and it's, it's certainly subject to uh, critique and I, I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts. So feel free to join in. I, I appreciate the support. All right. Sounds good. Well, well thank you again for uh, coming on the podcast.